say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. Hello everyone and welcome to a new direction. My name is Jay Izzo and holy cow, we got a great show. I, I know, Jay, every, every week? Really? It's a great show. You, know, you don't understand how great this show is going to be. I have a toolbox in a book. <laughs> I have a toolbox for leadership and success in a book. I have the author who has created the toolbox for leadership and success of, of this book right here on the show. Yeah, her name's Dr. Liz Bywater. Holy cow. You're about to be, hello, blown away. I'm just telling you, the book is called Slow Down to Speed Up. That's the name of the book. It's called Slow Down to Speed Up. It is a fabulous book. Lead, Succeed, and Thrive. I am telling you, the book is an outstanding read. It digs deep, and it's got so many practical tools in it. You're going to love it. And by the way, you're going to love her because she is she's just, she's just this really cool person. And she's actually, you know, just because she's got PhD at the end of her name, she's not she's not like wired really she's like fun and interesting and she's really cool and you're going to love her because she is that way but hey let's do what we do every week right what's that well i check in with you uh and thank you everybody for listening by the way on castbox fm facebook live uh castbox fm live and and of course uh you know the oak 93.5 here in raleigh and and iheart radio and itunes and everywhere else thank you all for listening to the show i, I am uh, grateful, you, you, I can't explain to you how you've grown the show, but you really have. But let's let's do what we do every week. In case you're new to the show, what we do every week is I check in with you in the four areas of your life. And I believe that we are four-part people. We are physical people, we are mental people, we are emotional people, and we are spiritual people. And I believe that we we need to check in with ourselves on a regular basis on where we're at right now and then what we can do to change that. So... Let me tell you how it works. So in, we're going to start with the physical area. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being miserable, 10 being outstanding, how, you, how do you think you're doing physically? 5 is kind of average, okay? So how do you think you're doing physically out there, right? You got you got, got a number? Do you have something that, right, right got a number that maybe you say, ah, you know, I'm a 3, you know, or maybe you go, hey, you know what, I'm great, I'm an 8, all right? Awesome. So what makes you that number is the first question. And then the second number is what can you do to get to the next number? Because I'm not trying to get you, if you're a three, I'm not trying to get you to a 10 right now. I just want you to get to a four. You know, so what are the things that you need to do physically in order to get yourself better to that next stage, right? Whatever that number is for you. All right. So you got that? All right. Perfect. So that's your first number. All right. So now your second number is the mental area. And what do I mean by mentally? Well, there's two sides of our brain. We have a left side and a right side, and yes, it's connected with this thing we call a corpus callosum, and that's way too geeky for most people. But the fact of the matter is, what we consume mentally kind of does affect us, and, and also it helps us grow in our knowledge. And the one thing that's beautiful about as we age, and I don't care how old you are and, and who you are listening to the show, you can always be learning. And so what are you learning? What are you consuming? And what are you doing to grow the right side of your brain, which is that creative, fun side, and, and that logical side, which is the left side of your brain? And how do you think you're doing in that area on that same scale of one to 10, one being miserable, 10 being outstanding? How do you think you're doing? What's that number for you? All right. So you got that number five's average. All right. So you got a mental number. Okay. And by the way, there's so many things you could do. You know, I, I talk, you know, regularly that, you know, consuming the show helps you, I think, creatively think about both sides of your brain. I think, you know, taking up a new instrument or, you know, can help you. I think reading the right materials can help you in so many different areas. So what do you need to do to change to get to that next number mentally? All right. Good. Got it? All right. You got two numbers. You got the physical, the mental. And the third number is your emotional number. And oftentimes you'll hear us talk, uh, especially in psychology, you'll hear us talk things like emotional quotient or emotional intelligence. And, you know, well, th those are fancy terms. I'm just going to break it down really simple. Scale of one to 10, one being miserable, 10 being outstanding. How well are you able to control your own emotions? Seriously, how well are you able to control your own emotions? And not only that, how well are you able to tap into the emotions of others? That meaning that how well can you understand somebody's emotions? How well can you empathize with someone's emotions? I didn't say sympathy. I said empathize, meaning that you understand them, right? What, so how are you doing in that emotional realm? A scale of one to 10. You got that number, right? And then you have to ask yourself, what do I need to do about it? And, you know, so often when it comes to our emotions, you know, it's called emotional control. I mean, we can be intentional, 
right? We do not have to feel what we feel, right? We don't. We can change it. We do have choices here, right? I'm not saying that they're easy, but you do have choices on how you want to deal with your emotions. So, so that's the question. The question is, how well are you controlling your emotions? How well you're willing to tap into others' emotions? And what do you need to do to get better at that, all right? So you got three numbers, right? We got the physical, the mental, the emotional. And then finally, we have the spiritual. And a lot of people ask me, they go, I don't touch any of the spiritual thing. That's, that's... All right, look, here. this is what's all left over, right, that we just can't explain. And, and trust me, there's so much we can't explain in this life and that we never will explain in this life. But there are things that bring us to center that sometimes you'll hear somebody say, you know, music touched my soul, a, a place that we can't necessarily see, but that, that does exist because we can tell that it brings us a sense of peace or a sense of joy. And sometimes that's God. Sometimes that's nature. Sometimes it's it's karma. Sometimes it's something else. It could be a variety of things for you. It could be meditation. Whatever that is, the question is, whatever that is for you, how is that working out for you on a scale of one to 10, right? One being miserable, 10 being outstanding, right? How is that How is that really working? Is it working for you? If it is your relationship with God, how's that going for you? If it's, it's meditation, how's that working for you, right? And then what can you do to change it, right? It's the same question I asked you on the other three areas of your life. So you have four numbers, right? And you have to think of those four numbers, not as something collectively that you could put an average going, well, you know, I was a 10 physically, I was a one, you know, mentally, so I'm a five. No, 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 no. They're all individual. You have to think of them as four legs of a chair. And you have to, you have to understand that if you're sitting in a chair that's uneven, right, it makes it really difficult to sit in that chair. But if that chair is also too low, it also makes it very difficult to sit in that chair. The whole idea here of this exercise is to take a look at these areas. How do we build those four legs up to getting them to the best height that we possibly can and bring them up together? And when we do that, you know what? That's what makes us a, a complete person and a more full, full person and more fulfilled person. So with that said, I want to tell you about somebody who's going to fulfill you today. Her name is Liz Bywater. Liz Bywater. What can I say about her except that she is, oh gosh, so Dr. Liz Bywater, yes, she is a doctor, has been probably called, well, no, she has. She's been called a one-of-a-kind leadership expert. She, working at the intersection of business and psychology, she brings together practical experience advising top executives across the Fortune 500 companies, advanced education, and a dynamic personal style to inspire, you know how I feel about inspiration, engage and inv- advise her clients. Yes, folks, she's also a coach. For over a decade, top global organizations have requested Liz's help in resolving issues such as creating extraordinary extraordinary client relationships, increasing marketing persuasion, increasing innovation, and driving productive collaborations in an increasing complex world. She advises senior leaders at some of the world's most successful companies. You may have heard of some of these, Johnson & Johnson, Bristol Myers, Squibb, Thompson Reuters, the list goes on and on. It's, it's pretty endless. She also is a thought leader in organizational excellence. Uh, she provides expert commentary for publications. And you may have heard of some of these too, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Fast Company, USA Today. Yeah, just a few. Just a few of those average ones. She earned her PhD from, uh, I think it's pronounced Demir, uh, Institute for Advanced Psychological Studies. Her undergraduate degree is from Cornell, and she graduated Phi Beta Kappa and Cum Laude. These are words that I never heard when I graduated college. Uh, they are Latin, uh, is what they are. And she's a member of the APA, <laughs> Society for Advanced Consulting. Uh, please, everybody, welcome to the show, Liz Bywater. Liz, Dr. Liz Bywater, welcome to A New Direction. Thanks so much, Jay. Uh, that's a, a wonderful intro, and I'm super happy to be here. Well, first of all, I want to just say that uh, I, you have been, it's so hard to introduce someone like you because you've done so much <laughs> that it, 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 and you have, I mean, really, you've done so much. And so what happens is it's really hard because I can't include every single thing that you've done. And it makes it really difficult for me to get everything in because there's so much that you, that, that you, that you have done. And so. Uh, it's it's just an honor to have you here on the show. Your book, uh, which I loved to death, and I'm holding up for people on Facebook Live. I know you people on Cast FM, Castbox FM, and podcasts can't see the book, but you know, it's called "Slow Down to Speed Up," and I had a little fun with that in the intro. Lead, succeed, and thrive in a 24/7 world. And what I loved about this book is because it, it literally is a toolbox uh, for people when it comes to leading and succeeding and thriving in a very, very busy world. And I want to just dig right in to this 
uh, book, and I'm just going to jump into chapter one because chapter one, I think, is uh, absolutely uh, imperative to understanding the rest of the book. And chapter one is entitled Racing to the Results. Uh, what's wrong with going too fast? So why don't we start with your own question? <laughs> well, Dr. Liz Bywater, what's wrong with going too fast? Well, the problem with going too fast is, one, it's not sustainable. So if you think of somebody running a race, um, you know, there are people who can run very, very fast, but usually they're sprinters. And so they can run fast for a short period of time. And then, you know, we, 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 burn, we burn up, we run out of speed, run out of steam, and, and, you know, you have to take a break. So you can only go for so long. There's also the issue when you're going too fast, it's very hard to remain in control of where you're going. You can trip, you can make mistakes, uh, you can end up heading in the wrong direction. And when we go too fast uh, individually, as a team in an organization, um, as a society, what we end up doing is we end up making the same mistakes over and over again, or simply losing track of what it is we're really trying to achieve. You know, I, 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 I one of the things that, that you just said, and that just that really struck me was, I get it, we make mistakes, but I think, you know, we're both coaches here as well as authors. And, and I understand that we make mistakes when we're moving too fast. I get that piece. But I think the piece that sometimes for people in business is that they get caught, the, the, the thing that you said, they get caught, so caught up in the short-term wins or putting out the fires that they lose track of the long-term goals. That's exactly right. And, and, and that's it, exactly right. Yeah, and and and, it beca- and why is it so hard for us, in your opinion? I, I'm not I'm not going to hold you to this, or I'm, neither am I going to make you write a research paper on this. But why is it that it's so <laughs> hard for us as business people to not see that we're we're so caught up in putting out all these fires and working on the day to day that we lose sight of the bigger picture, the vision of the future? Why is that so hard? Well, I think there are at least three reasons and maybe more, but the three that come to mind is one, we're living under tremendous pressure. Mm -hmm. Businesses are under pressure to do well, to perform well, to hit the numbers. There's a lot of public scrutiny. There is uh, scrutiny from investors and so forth. So there's a tremendous sense of pressure to move quickly, get results fast. So you have that. You have, if you're a publicly traded company, you have pressure to get quarterly results. You have to report out, how are we doing? You can't say, well, we took a little breather. We're stepping back so we can do really well in a year or we can lead the market in two or three years. No, the expectation is that you hit it hard, you hit it fast, you meet your numbers. And so there becomes that really short-term focus and that kind of firefighting mentality. And I think the third thing is that we're all incredibly accessible all the time. People can reach us, you know, with a phone call, although that's, you know, not done quite as much as it used to be, because instead we instant message, we text, we send emails. You know, there are a million ways that people can reach us. There's almost no respite from it uh, unless you create it, unless you shut your phone off, unless you create boundaries around your time. So you put all of these things together and the focus really becomes on, you know, how do I hit that milestone that's right in front of me? And sometimes you're so busy looking at that, you don't even look up to see what's up ahead. It's it's so true. We're talking with Biz uh, Liz Bywater. Wow, did you see what I just did there? Wow, I was getting so I was I was <laughs> such a you, well. You just you say in your book right right early on. There's like three thousand five hundred decisions that we have to make in a given day, right? And then we're making right. them so we're making them so fast that. Uh, the more we make those decisions, the more depleted that we become, and 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 we have a tendency sometimes to make mistakes. I just did, and it's the beginning of my day. So, <laughs> but we're with <laughs> we're with Dr. Liz Bywater. She wrote wrote this book entitled uh, "Slow Down to Speed Up: How to uh, Lead, Succeed, and Thrive in a 24/7 World." It's available on Amazon, your favorite bookstore. Just to ask for it if they don't have it, tell them get it in now because you want it. And I promise you, Barnes and Noble. Hudson Books will get it in for you as well as well as your local bookstore. Let's talk about being depleted as a leader, and because uh, I know for a fact that the clients that I coach, uh, who are owners, business owners, and are leaders and that type of thing, they talk about constantly that they're under this pressure, and they're making so many decisions and so many major decisions that they have depleted themselves, and yet they keep going. What, help help us understand, you know, 
what do we need to do? What do they need to do? How do they wrap their mind around what they need to do in terms of, you know, I'm, they know they're exhausted, but they're still doing it anyway. Give, give them something. Yeah, so there are a few things we can talk about. First thing is this, the whole concept of sort of putting on your own oxygen mask first. You know, if you fly, I'm sure, you know, you've heard a million times sure. they haven't changed this announcement since I was a kid, um, you know, some time back which is always that announcement about put on your own oxygen mask in case we lose pressure before you go to help people around you. And as a leader, it's really essential that you are finding ways to be healthy and rested and give yourself some some pauses in the busyness, the frenetic pace of work every day. You block in your vacations. You have somebody that you can talk to about important decisions. All of those things that help keep you healthy and complete and and, uh, energized because when a leader becomes depleted, uh, overwhelmed, burnt out, what happens is that cascades. It's sort of like, um, you know, if you are, um, you you know, if you've got a family, if you're a parent, in some ways, you know, as leaders, we are the parents of our organization. And so when a parent isn't doing well, well, the rest of the family doesn't tend to do very well either. So there are a few things that I would recommend. I mean, the first thing is, you know, we hear this all the time and and often people don't um, effectively do this, which is focus ruthlessly, diligently on priorities. You know, some of my clients will say, well, okay, I've made my list of priorities and there are, you know, 30 things on that list. Well, 30 things are um, possibly all somewhat important, but they're absolutely not priorities. They cannot be 30 priorities. They cannot all get done well at the same time. Right. So really to focus in on what is most important to do now, because it's going to have impact and it's relevant and it's meaningful and perhaps there's a deadline. Um, what is it that I personally, as a leader, need to do because it's something that I have been hired to do that is strategic, that requires my level of authority versus what are the things that I can delegate, that I can share with others, that I can help perhaps develop the people on my team, the people around me by giving them, you know, some piece of the pie, so to speak. Um, And what are the things that don't get done right now because they're not urgent, they might be interesting, they might be important, they might be helpful down the road, but not everything can get done instantly in the moment. And so really being thoughtful about what has to get done by whom and when, um, those are ways to really make sure that you are preventing the burnout and the overwhelm that can easily overtake any leader. We're talking with Liz Bywater, author of this book called uh, Slow Down, Speed Up. And uh, you're listening to us live here on A New Direction. And for those of you who are listening on the podcast, welcome. Uh, Thanks for joining us. We appreciate that. And also our folks over at uh, the Oak 93.5. So, Liz, one of the things that you talk about in terms of we live in this such this fast-paced world, and and I it, it, it comes right out of chapter two. You call it hitting the brakes, and you, you talk about taking a pause. Okay, now I, I I am not trying to be a devil's advocate. Yes, I am. I, I am trying to be a devil's advocate in this a little bit. But but executives will say to me, I don't have the time to take a pause. I'm sure you've I'm sure you've heard that, L- L- uh, Liz. I don't. I'm sorry, Liz. Yeah. I don't have the time to pause. So how do you expect me to do that? So let me ask on behalf of all those people out there who are going, uh, I I I don't have time to take a pause, Liz. What do you tell them? Yeah, well, first of all, I hear that I do hear that all the time. It feels impossible or indulgent or even lazy to take a little breather from, you know, we sort of are applauded for how fast we can go and how many hours we can work and how quickly we respond to emails and texts and so on. And, um, you know, the fact is you have to protect time to think, to connect with others, to be strategic, to develop support for initiatives to identify where there may be roadblocks to success so that you can help eliminate the problems before they arise. Um, And and as we spoke about earlier, to remain energized and excited and creative and innovative innovative in all of that. So one thing that I recommend to my executive clients is to take out your calendar, have your administrative assistant, if you have one, you know, help you with this, but block out periods of time. It can be 15 minutes a day. It can be an hour you know, at the end of the week, it can be a day with your team once a quarter, um, but time where you are stepping out of what I call the busyness of running a business, 
where you are thinking, you are strategizing, you are collaborating, you are allowing new ideas to come to the surface. Um, you have to consider this essential because it really is. It's the only way that a business can, and, 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 and actually as an individual leader, as a career person, that you can continue to, to grow and learn and um, be successful. It's, it's, just, it's just foundational. And it is, it's also counterintuitive. And before we get to that, let me just do this real quick because the counterintuitiveness that, that, uh, and I think Dr. Bywater, Liz, I'm calling, I'm, I'm going back and forth. Okay, people, but we're going <laughs> to, but, but we're going to talk about the paradox because there is a paradoxical uh, process here that's not going to make sense. But before I do that, you know what? I just need to say thank you uh, to our sponsors. And, and, of course, the one that we always have to say thank you to is inline business brokers and advisors. Um, listen, they partner with business owners when it's time to sell their business. They are internationally known. They are the experts when it comes to confidentiality and selling your business. It's part of the registered tra- trademark. And so when it's time to sell your business, why not contact the professionals at inline business brokers and advisors? You can learn more by going online to inline.com. That's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And also, Linda Craft and Team Realtors, no matter where you're at in the world, Linda Craft and her team can help you find the right professional to help you sell your home or buy your next home. Or if you happen to be into the Research Triangle Park area, why not stop in at 7300 Six Forks Road and find out why they are known for their legendary customer service. And you can learn more about Linda Craft and her team by going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we are back with Dr. Liz Bywater and her awesome book entitled Slow Down to Speed Up, Lead, Succeed, and Thrive in a 24-7 World. Who doesn't want to lead and succeed and thrive in a 24-7 world? It's so busy. And uh, Dr. Liz Bywater is with us. And by the way, this book is available Amazon, book, Barnes & Noble, your favorite bookstore. If they don't have it, tell them to get it in. And as a matter of fact, you may want to say, why don't you have it? It's that good. You should have you should have several copies on hand, and you should be telling people to buy it. That's what you should be doing. Um, but yeah, she's she's joining us right now. She's smiling. I can hear it. Uh, so I'm, I'm having some fun with it. I am. You can hear that right across the phone. It's <laughs> I true. Did. I, I, I can. I can. I heard you smile. Believe it or not, uh, over there. Let's do it. So one of the things we talk talk about before we before we left is we talked about how it's kind of a paradox and it's a little counterintuitive that you actually have to put on the brakes, that you actually kind of have to stop, right? Because the, as busy business people and as busy business leaders and as busy, busy business owners, and by the way, it's much more difficult to say when there's so many Bs, but there's, it's, it's, it is counterintuitive to stop and take a pause in order to be actually more effective, why why, it why is that but why is i mean it makes sense to me but why is it so counterintuitive to the executive or the the, the business leader why is it so why is that such a i mean i i think they hear it but i don't think they i don't think they can agree with it why is it why is that such a hard place for them to jump to Well, you know, I think sometimes this comes down to um, not always having a team in place that a leader feels confident delegating to. So um, that's not always the case. But I have a lot of leaders that I work with, uh, C-suite executives, where the perception, sometimes it's accurate, sometimes it's not, is that if they're not taking care of the work personally, it won't get done fast enough, it won't get done well enough. Um, And so part of what I do when I'm working with these uh, executive clients of mine is we really spend some time making sure that they have the right people in the right roles doing the right things, that they are taking the time to lay out what the expectations for performance are, that they're aligning around how quickly things will get done and what the top priorities are, and that they're making room for people to develop the skills and the abilities and the relationships to get the work done well. Um, because if you, if you can't feel confident that you can hand something off, um, you are going to be in that position where you feel like you just have to go as fast as possible and try to accomplish as many things personally as you possibly can. And that's simply not the role of a senior leader or a business owner. Can, 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 can we get like really personal with leaders real quick, Liz? Are we okay if we get personal with leaders? Because I'm, sure. I'm about to say something that's probably not real popular, but is really the truth when it comes to them. 
they like to be in control of everything. That's not a real pocket. They're, yeah. contr- they're so many of them are control freaks. Yes, I called you a control freak. Okay, I know this one. Okay, because I'm I'm good at it myself. By the way, I have to do everything, right? I don't want to delegate because I feel like if I don't do it, nobody else is going to get it done. And 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 if they're not, and if they are doing going to get it done, it's they're not going to do it right, and they're certainly not going to do it the way I'm going to do it because they don't know. And by the way, they're not nearly as invested as I am into this thing. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to have to take charge of this whole thing because that's the way it is. And so I'm going to micromanage you because this is what I'm going to do. Does that sound familiar, Liz, at all? It does sound familiar, and you know, I think sometimes it comes from a place of you know, genuinely wanting to make sure, and I think right. actually almost always comes from a place of wanting right. to make sure things get done well and that the business is, is successful and that there aren't, you know, um, really difficult mistakes that get made and you have to turn around and spend even more time trying to fix right. them. So I think often it's coming from a good place. But I think the problem is it it does not ultimately reap the, the best outcomes. And it actually can be quite career limiting because sure. think of it, think of this. If you have someone who is, for example, a technical expert, you know, they got their job because they're really good at the technical work. That is why they're hired. That's what they do. And maybe over the course of time, they have been um, promoted to a managerial role. So now their job is actually to get the technical work uh, delegated out to the people who work for them. And if they're still so busy getting all the work done, they're not developing their team and they're not showing that they're actually very good managers and if you get stuck there well then you really don't have a great chance of getting promoted up to a vice president level and so on and so on so you end up getting stuck and if you do manage to make your way up the ladder to you know a senior vice president a general manager a ceo you know chances are you've got a pretty big organization underneath you and they're literally there's no way you can possibly do all the work yourself and and absolutely no way you can do it well. So some of it is about control. I think often it comes from a good place, but it's, um, it's certainly not a path to success for yourself, your organization or for your customers. Yeah, because you can only control so much. You know, when, when, when the business, when the business is small, right, we, we may be able to control a lot of things, but as the as the business grows and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and branches out, and let's say you have a second office or a third office, or now you're part of a region, or you, you eventually go nationwide, you can't do it all. And, and this is where I think one of the greatest points that you make here is you're then limited because if you want to do all this yourself, you're then limited at one size because you'll never be able to grow. You will never. That's exactly right. Be, yeah, and by the way, you you <laughs> you use a phrase uh, in some of your examples here about letting you have to let go, you know, letting letting yeah. go, which, by the way, is a again, that's one of those really hard things for I think for leaders to do I think and and also but it's necessary for greater success it's one of those it it, it is paradoxical in so many ways isn't it I, I have to let go to become more successful and to be a better leader it's it's kind of it really is kind of crazy and that's what your book kind of does throughout this it's like one paradox after another going no you want to you want to speed up you got to slow down <laughs> you want you want to be you want to you want to you want to grow you got to let go I, I I think that's the beauty about this book is that the reality is so much of this is just is paradoxical, isn't it? Well, it is. And yet once you start implementing some of these strategies, it starts to become very uh, automatic because you start to see that it leads to more success. Um, it's interesting. I've had organizations where I maybe started working with the senior executive, and then from there we branched off into working with the executive team, and then they would bring the slow down to speed up um, tools and 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 so forth to their you know parts of the organization. So what I like to think of is that to, although it's paradoxical, once you start adopting and sharing, and it becomes part of the organizational fabric, is you you're creating a culture of slowing down to speed up. Everyone's got kind of the same terminology technology that they can reflect upon and there becomes mutual agreement that it actually makes sense to take some pauses in the frenetic pace to really be clear on what direction do we want to take next and you know who needs to do what when in order to be most effective and what are the things we have to let go of you know there are a lot of uh, companies and, and departments within companies where there are 
initiatives that are ongoing or uh, pieces of work that are continued because, well, that's the way we've always done it, or that was successful when we did it in the past, but it's not successful anymore, and people are really spinning their wheels, and they're just too overwhelmed with work to do the stuff that's most important today and leading into the future. So yes, it's paradoxical, but this letting go, slowing down, taking what I call a strategic pause, mm -hmm. all of that is um, really not as hard to do as it sounds. And once you get everybody on board kind of thinking this way and acting this way, um, you will find that the whole organization becomes so much more effective. Uh, we're talking with Liz, Dr. Liz Bywater. She's author of the book that we are working our way through called Slow Down to Speed Up, uh, Lead, Survive, and Thrive in a 24-7 World. And she is absolutely killing it right now, folks. I'm just telling you. <laughs> it, it, you you're getting you're getting awesome, uh, just awesome, awesome insights uh, from somebody that you would be paying thousands upon thousands of dollars for. And she's doing that with us here today. And we are so grateful for that as well. So chapter three was my favorite chapter. And I'll tell you why. I love digging into um, my past. I love digging into uh, what makes me who I am what were my highlights, what were my lowlights, and uncovering those things that make make me who I am. I love doing that, but I know that everybody is real comfortable with that, that not everybody is real comfortable with, you know, looking at their past and whether good or bad. Some people are not real comfortable with that, and I think, you know, naturally it makes us feel vulnerable and uh, it feels like we're opening up old wounds. And as I tell people, you know what, it's okay to open up an old wound if you heal it right. And uh, it's because then you can actually get get what's festering in there out. And um, and I love what you did here because if the, the chapter title is called Checking the Rearview Mirror, but here's where I love what you talk about. And I want to talk about pivot points. Because, well, let, I'm going to ask you, first of all, define for the listeners what a pivot point is, as you describe it, looking back. Yeah, the way I think about a pivot point is what are the kind of essential or formative moments in one's life, personal life, um, career history, educational life, that have had deep and meaningful impact on who we are and how we go through the world today. So they could be um, successes, awards, achievements, recognitions, um, things that you, know, you feel really good and positive about that have helped inform and advise you know, what kind of leader you are, what career you've chosen, what kind of a family member you are, and so on. Um, and then there are what I call pivotal regrets. And although regret is kind of a loose term here, it could be um, pivotal disappointments, pivotal failures, pivotal obstacles, but these are kind of the negative experiences in life um, that have, again, informed who we are today. Sometimes they are the things that are holding us back um, because they have affected our career path or our confidence level or what we aim for, what we think we can achieve. And sometimes they're the things that have propelled us forward because we, we have in some way aspire to overcome adversity and achieve something greater. So these the pivot points are these pivotal moments in life. Some feel very positive, some don't feel so positive, but they're all very important. And the stepping back to reflect on them can be an essential part of creating your path forward. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we kind of bypass sometimes these different points in our life that are really significant. I mean, you know, I love going back into my childhood because there's sometimes there's these points where I go, you know, that was actually kind of a pivotal thing. You know, I, I, one of the things, uh, you know, I, and, and I don't mean just the successes I mean, and we'll talk about, you know, your success, um, your, your pivotal successes, but in, in terms of pivot points, but, and separate that from, you know, maybe the more pivotal, you know, regrets, but one of the things that I think is just so helpful is to take a look and go, what were, what are some of the moments that first come to light about that really sparked me, you know, as a kid, because I think you say this, I think you said this in your book and I think you, I think you mentioned it is that quite often the things that sparked us as a kid kind of carry with us as a child, actually kind of carry with us through the rest of our life. And they, they still spark us. We may have not remembered them and we may not, 
and I, I'm of course I'm paraphrasing you greatly, but they do they have they have an impact on us on some level, and those impacts should not be overlooked because sometimes we get caught up into doing something in, in our life that really it is does not align up with our you know our the pivot points in our life. Is that true? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, for every single one of us, there are events, relationships, experiences um, throughout our childhoods and through adulthood that have impact on, um, on, on, on decisions that we make, the people that we opt to spend our lives with, the careers that we choose, the way we lead an organization, and so on. And um, ideally, we have some conscious knowledge of these things. It doesn't mean that we sit around each day and sort of self-reflect and talk to others about ourselves all the time, because then we sort of become sort of self-involved right, and, and, right. and you get stuck in it. Right. But to spend some time saying, you know, how did my family constellation and my relationships with my parents or my most important teachers or somebody, uh, you know, at my church or synagogue or in my neighborhood, how did those relationships, how did those experiences impact my level of confidence, my um, capabilities, my drive, the way I respond to other people and to challenges? You know, the more you get it, the more control you have over it, rather than us kind of having knee-jerk reactions to right. what comes our way. Why is it so important for us to really look at those pivot points in our life? Why is it why is it so critical? Because I mean it is cru- I found it crucial, but I'd like to hear from you why you see it so crucial. Well, you know, it's interesting, Jay, you know, as you mentioned, my background is as a psychologist. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. And um, you know, what what goes on um, in our unconscious mind, the part that we are not aware of on a day-to-day basis, is often the stuff of childhood, is often the stuff of our history. And when, we're not, when we don't bring that up into our conscious awareness, where we can actually look at it and work with it as the adults we are today, sometimes we end up responding as the people we were when we were much younger and didn't actually have much control in the world. So I'll give you an example. You mentioned earlier that um, leaders often are – Uh, very into control. They want to control things. Well, it may be that for at least some of those leaders, maybe they came from a childhood where they didn't have as much control as they'd like. In fact, I would venture to say none of us have as much control as we'd like as children. Our parents tell us what to do. Our teachers tell us what to do. The bus driver tells us what to do. And so by becoming more aware of what your triggers are and who you were and who you are today, the more conscious control you can exercise in your decision making, your leadership style, your business, your personal life, and all of that. Love that. We're with uh, Dr. Liz Bywater, author of the book Slow Down to Speed Up and uh, Lead, Succeed, and Thrive in a 24 7 World. And she has been so gracious. To- um, to be spending some time with us today and talking through the book and we are talking about uh, pivot points and uh, one of the there's two beyond our pivot points that are significant things in our life you talk about pivotal successes and pivotal regrets what's an example of pivotal success and why do we why should we be looking at those well, so let me take it for a moment into the realm of an organization or a team. Um, often I will work with teams that either are working through a new challenge or perhaps there's a new leader or a new constellation of the management team. And to take some time to understand as a department, um, what were the pivotal moments that brought the team to where they were today? You know, what were the things that went especially well? Those pivotal successes are really important to spend some time on. One, because we're always going so fast. Often we can be successful, but nobody takes a minute to say, wow, that was great. We really hit it out of the park. Let's take a moment and celebrate success. It helps you feel good. It increases motivation. It inspires others to kind of reach that same level of success. And also you can better replicate it. Or we did this, this, and this. I think we can apply this to this new initiative or project or this new phase. Um, So to take the time to reflect on what's already gone well is very important. It's not self-indulgent. It's not self-aggrandizing. It is a part of what leads to additional motivation and further and future success. Wow. 
you 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 make it sound like you've maybe written something about this once or twice, or if you've actually done this before. Yeah, just a couple times. You sound like, oh, yeah. Well, actually, she's talked about this before. This is not an unusual question. I haven't hit that question yet. There's usually there's usually one time in this in this in in, in in during this show where I will hit a question where you go, I've never had anybody ask me that before, and I haven't hit it yet. But I'm I'm I'm, I'm digging. I promise you, I'm digging. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, we're talking with Dr. Liz Bywater. Slow down to speed up. Be right back after we talk about this. You know, uh, since the very beginning of the show, Endline Business Brokers and Advisors has been our sponsor, and uh, we we are grateful for them and and thankful for them for doing that. And let me tell you what Endline is. They represent profitable privately held companies with gross annual revenues in excess of a million dollars. Inline delivers the highest market value in the shortest amount of time with complete confidentiality. That is the registered trademark. They are literally internationally known when it comes to business brokerage. So start there, right? And and you can learn more by going to inline.com. That's www.enlign.com. And we thank them. And of course, Linda Craft and Team Realtors. No matter where you're at in the world, they can help you find the right expert when it comes to residential real estate to help you sell your home or buy your home. They are known for the legends, being the legends of customer service. They've been doing it for over 35 years, legendary customer service. There's a reason why they're in this industry for that long, successfully helping people sell their home or find their next home. You need to find out why, and you can do that by going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com, and we thank them for their sponsorship of Liz Bywater and, of course, A New Direction. And we're back here with on a new direction with Liz, Dr. Liz Bywater and her book, Slow Down to Speed Up. We talked about pivotal successes when we last chatted, but let's talk about pivotal regrets because this one's a little, this one's a little more difficult for people to talk about is our pivotal regrets. What are they and why do we need to talk about them? Pivotal regrets are the things that have happened in life, whether we ourselves created it because we made a decision, we chose a direction, um, or because they happened to us. So um, I'll give you an example. When I'm, sometimes when I'm working with teams and we're having these sort of pivot points or accelerating success um, conversations, maybe we'll go off-site for a day or two and we'll, we'll really dive into some of this stuff, people will share things that have occurred in their life that have really driven who they are today. So for instance, I had clients who are very senior level executives who um, were never good enough as a child. Mm. So the pivotal regret is that they could never please a parent, no matter how well they did in athletics, no matter how top of the class they were, no matter what they achieved, it wasn't enough. And so this becomes really important because it's a double-edged sword. In some ways, it has driven them to the incredible levels of success they've achieved, and it's been a motivator. And in some ways, perhaps, it's made them a really difficult boss where nobody can ever do anything that is effective or successful enough and people maybe don't stick around very long because they never really feel recognized for what they bring to the table Mm -hmm. so it is a pivotal regret in the sense that it is something that was not satisfying that wasn't really positive in childhood but in this case has both positive and some negative impacts the more you can look at it and recognize it the better you can navigate okay i get this about myself let me really think about how I'm coming across to others, how I'm interacting with my team. I want to continue to use this motivation to drive success, but I don't want to push people away and have them feel the way I felt as a kid, which is (laughs) never really good enough. Right. I get that. I, I personally loved this piece of the puzzle. And by the way, I'm still working on it because these are not something that you do in 15 minutes. Uh, as as okay. I am finding out as I started digging through this book and going through. And by the way, what um, Liz, Dr. Liz Bywater does in this book is she actually gives you an outline of how to set up your own outline, how to look at your pivot points, how to look at your pivotal successes, how to look at your pivotal regrets. And matter of fact, if you go to the back of the book, um, which is chapter eight, she has this chapter on literally, she gives you a diagnostic test, a diagnostic tool, um, how to, you know, checking your speedometer and, to, and how to interpret your results, starting your strategic um, uh, pause tips, uh, pivotal points, the regrets that I just talked about, successes, their, your vision, setting your sights, how to craft your vision, et cetera, so forth. There's literally, all this is in, the, in this book. I mean, literally the whole outline 
of what she does, how she does it, and literally gives you the practical tool box. I told you at the beginning of the show that this is a toolbox. I'm not, I wasn't kidding. This thing is literally a toolbox for you to be able to literally navigate and help yourself get through, which is why you need to buy this book. And by the way, folks, this is not a, this is not like a three, 400 page book that you go, oh, Jay, I don't want to read it. No, 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 no. You don't understand. This book is not a long book, but it is so chock full. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Liz Bywater's wisdom, her insight, but then she gives you the practical applied tools to work your way through, whether you're a leader of a team, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're just trying to do something for yourself, you know, independent of all of that. This book, Slow Down, Speed Up, does every single thing that you could ask for in terms of really uncovering everything that you should be uncovering in order to become the leader and be as successful as you possibly could be. And, and it's a great book. And I know that it's one of those books that uh, I'm, I, it, I'm going to tell you where it's going to sit. It's going to sit on top of everything. And the reason why it's going to sit on top of everything, because I'm going to keep referring back to it over and over and over again, because it's just, a, it's a fabulous, it's a fabulous book. It's more than a read. It is a toolkit. And I really am highly and strongly recommending that you, that you get it. Uh, and it is available on Amazon. It's available at your local bookstore. If they don't have it, they'll get it in for you. Barnes Noble, Hudson Books, they can get, get this in for you. You can even go to uh, Liz Bywater's site, and it is exactly how it spells, L-I-Z-B-Y-W-A-T-E-R. And you know what? You can even order a book from her. You know You can do that as well. And uh, so feel free to do that as well. Um, I'm not going to go chapter by chapter by chapter, even though I want to so bad, Liz, I really do. Um, I, I, I am going to briefly say that chapter four, setting your sights, what do you, what do you love? Uh, what do you bring and where are you headed? And I did love this chapter because it really was an reevaluation of our value and, uh, you know, really understanding and, and you may want to say more about it, but I really felt it was, okay, what is my real value here to the organization? What is my real value to what I bring to my clients? What is my real value to what I bring to the company? And I and what is what is it that makes me up? Because after I've gone through all these different pivotal points, I should have a clear vision of who I am and what I am, what I'm passionate about, and what do I bring to the table? Do I, do I have that summarized pretty well? I think that's terrific. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Um, and that's really again, this is where you need to take a pause to do some sort of reasonable self reflection. Um, you can also do this with people who know you well. You can do this with people who are close in your life, um, who can give you some of their perspective. Because sometimes it is hard to see ourselves objectively. In fact, it's very difficult to see ourselves objectively. Um, but yes, you know, what is it that you do well? What is it? Where are your strengths? What do you love to do? What's most important to you? And to really look at that and see do these things align with my values. And then the other piece, you know, if you're considering what do you want to do next in your career or how do you really maximize your contribution, you know, what is it that, you know, the company needs from me? What is the industry looking for? What will the market pay for? How do you find the merger of those things? Um, and there is an intersection for everybody. It's just a matter of really taking some time to think it through. And um, yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a really important and good use of time. Awesome. And speaking of time, uh, let's move to chapter five. We, jump, we quickly jumped over chapter five. I just want to move to chapter five real briefly. Uh, it's called Taking the Wheel, uh, Do the Right Things, Make the Best Decisions, Master Time. I'm going to read something that you wrote in a quote here. If you're constantly focused on the urgent, you will get pulled away from what's truly important. And by the way, my book is so highlighted in yellow and so dog-eared that you would not recognize your own book. Uh, that one has been highlighted so often it bled through the other side of the page. That's how heavily I highlighted that quote. Talk to us about being so constantly focused on the urgent that we get pulled away from what's truly important. Well, I'll tell you what, the focus on the urgent is so much about the firefighting. Mm. So somebody, you know, sends you an email or a text or knocks on your door or pulls on you in the hallway and it feels like, you have no um, choice in the matter but to say, sure, I'll take care of that right away. Or in your own mind, you feel like, wow, I've got 14 things on the to-do list and everything seems so pressing. Let me really work on these. And eventually what you're doing is you're just ticking things off a to-do list. You're not really moving forward to the achievement of some major goal or reaching of the vision. 
you're just ticking things off the list. And yes, some will be more impactful than others. But this is really about, not again, not just looking at the couple of feet in front of you as you run down the road, right. but what's way out ahead? Where's the finish line? Is that the finish line you want to go to? Um, really taking the time to be thoughtful and reflective so that you're not so caught up in the fire of the day that you can't be proactive and really in control of what direction you and your company are headed. Mm. In, in lo- Love that. And in this, inside this chapter, you have a little acronym. It's called CIA. And it the control, influence, accepted, and adapt. And talk to us how, how CIA plays a role in terms of taking the wheel. How, do, how does that all play? How does that all fit together? Yeah, absolutely. So I will say this and pivot points are two things that resonate with really every client or set of clients that I work with, because here's the thing, we are all under the illusion, really, that we are in control of so many things that we actually have no control over whatsoever. And so we spend time, effort, energy, mental space, trying to control pieces that are out of our domain. And so by identifying what is the stuff that you really do have personal and direct control over, what are the things that maybe you don't have immediate control over? Maybe, you know, this person doesn't work directly for you. Maybe there are some, you know, shifts in the company direction. Maybe the marketplace is changing, but perhaps you can have some influence. Okay, well, I'm going to let go of trying to control it, but I can have some influence and let me think through how I can best exert influence. And that's where you spend your time, effort, and energy. And then, you know, here's the letting go part. There are a whole lot of things that go on in the world and in business and in our jobs and in our lives over which we have no control and essentially no influence. And that is a scary thing for most of us. Oh, my God, I can't control it and I can't make it better. I can't make it different. Well, okay, those are the things that we have to accept and find a way to adapt to. So, you know, for instance, the economy will shift. You know, you'll see the stock market go up, you'll see the stock market go down. You can't personally, individually control that. You don't personally, individually have any influence over that. What is it that you are going to be doing, whether as a personal investor or the CEO of a company, to adapt to that circumstance that is bigger and broader than you have direct influence or control over? But by accepting it, you're not wasting time, effort, and energy in the wrong places. Awesome. You're really good at this. I'm seriously, you're really good at being able to answer my questions in such a succinct and, and brilliant way. I, I'm, I'm, you're so good. I really like. I feel like I need to be on a couch and I want to like confess things <laughs> to you all of a sudden. So I'm going to. I got it. See, there's the laughter. Well, that was that was. I've, I've worked all. I've worked 52 minutes for that one. Okay. Which, by the way, I can't believe we've been on for 52 minutes. I, 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 just, I can't believe it either. It's, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 gone, it's gone so fast. So I want to take a few a couple minutes here to talk about relax, recharge, and refuel because I am um, – you can't thrive if you're running on empty. And I think this is really one of your biggest messages that you give to people, um, especially leaders, executives. And I am I, – I just talked about this the other day about coaching – some of my coaching clients is that – and you, you gave an example of a young lady who gained like 40 pounds and, and it just, it was starting, she stopped exercising, she stopped eating right and all these things. And I talk to, I talk all the time that there's so many coaches out there who do not talk about the physical fitness, the, the importance of physical exercise and eating right if you're going to be a, the most successful person you can be and being a leader. And most coaches don't talk about it. They will talk about all these other things. But you're one of the few coaches who literally, for the first time, talked about and said, no, you you, you got to take care of the, the, the one tool that is <laughs> that you have to show up to work with every day called your body. But talk about, in general, relax, recharge, and refuel and the importance of that. Happy to do that. Yes. Well, listen, at the end of the day, right, we are just human beings doing the work. Right? Business is all just people working uh, with one another, trying to get some things accomplished. And you know what? We run down. If you're working you know, long hours, if you're not sleeping well, if you are rushing so much that maybe you're skipping meals or you're eating, you know, fast, convenient, not so healthy stuff, 
if you're not blocking out time on your calendar to spend time with the people that you love, if you're not taking vacations. I mean, there are so many things. If you're not getting out, let's say you're a music lover, you're not getting out to see some music or you're not playing sports or getting into nature. I mean, there, I'm, I'm naming all the things that maybe you're not doing, but the flip side of it is these are all things one can do and should do to stay energized and productive and creative and happy. And that sounds a bit corny, but frankly, if we go to, through our days feeling happy and energized and uh, kind of glad to be doing what we're doing, we are going to be far more successful, and so will the people around us. That's awesome. So, Dr. Liz Bywater, we have managed to get through 55 minutes of our day. And, and, and it has flown by like three <laughs> and it always it, it, it always it always happens when we're sitting around the table you know doing what we're doing enjoying the conversation enjoying each other and you've been so gracious and helpful to my folks I'm going to ask you one last question that I ask every guest on on a new direction the show is called a new direction because we try to help people find a new direction in their life or their career or their business and and sometimes all three uh, but if Dr. Liz Bywater, author of Slow Down to Speed Up, Lead, Succeed, and Thrive in a 24-7 World, could give people, this listening audience, a new direction based on this book, what would Dr. Liz Bywater, what would be her new direction for people? Oh, my new direction for people would be to t- slow it down. Stop feeling like you have to race to the finish line. You know, get get the most out of every day. And don't feel like it's a luxury or an indulgence to take a step back. Think things through. Recharge yourself. Connect with other people. Um, enjoy the work. And uh, it will actually make you more successful, not less. Her name's Liz Bywater. The book's entitled Slow Down to Speed Up. Lead, succeed, and thrive in a 24-7 world. You should be buying that right now. I'm serious. You, you need to just go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or whatever. Just buy the book because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be – you heard her. I mean, if, if you can imagine how life-changing – I mean, you heard her. She's life-changing, and the book is life-changing as well, and I, I promise you that because it's just been so good for me, and, uh, and I love practical applied books, and that's what this is. Folks, I say this every week. First of all, thank you for joining me on A New Direction. I know you have a lot of choices out there, and I appreciate the fact that you chose this show. And I'm always grateful for that. For all of you all over the world, France, I don't know where you came from, but you have become the number, th- literally the number two country outside of the United States to be downloading and listening to the show. So I just want to say merci. Uh, as well. So folks, I say it every week, but you know what? Be inspired because when you're inspired, that means that you can inspire others. And in turn, what that means is they can inspire others as well. And that can make this world an awesome place. I will see you next week with another great guest. And as I say every week, ciao, everybody. your confidence and the answers don't make sense you got to keep your hope alive you got to know you can survive this is your time to fly a new direction a brand new day a new direction things are gonna change Dreams will take you places you have never been before. Find your passion, find your